Welcome to MIT's Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. We're delighted you're all with us this evening. Uh, and welcome to our program, which is Solutions with Insight. It's a series that we conduct. And tonight, our title is Using Artificial Intelligence to Make Mammography Smarter. So this is a series, and it's a series that attempts to explain to people where the excitement is, the excitement at the various convergences, the convergence between biology and engineering, the convergence between academic studies and clinical practice. But the thesis of the Koch Institute is that through these various intersections, we can actually accelerate progress on cancer. And so tonight's program will give you a little sense of that. Um, we have um, a really um, remarkable trio of women presenting tonight, and I know this is going to be a really extraordinary conversation. Uh, between many <coughs> new innovations, many new discoveries, there is invariably a personal story, and there is a personal story here between Connie, Regina, and what they have put together uh, to make mammography a whole lot smarter. And it's a very special treat to have Linda Pizzuti Henry as our moderator tonight. She's going to conduct the conversation and then take questions from you afterwards. So if you have questions, hang on to them because we'll turn to the audience. So I want to make a few just very brief introductions to let you know who these people are. Uh, Regina Barzilai is the Delta Electronics Professor at MIT. She's a member of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. She is um, also a member of the Koch Institute. She's a member of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Lots of words. Simply put, Regina Barzlai is one of the world's leaders in machine learning. And she has committed herself to using her insights into machine learning to make clinical care better. Joining her is Connie Lehman, who is the Chief of Breast Imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's also a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School, and she's the co-director of the Avon Comprehensive Breast Evaluation Center at, at, at MGH. Connie has devoted her clinical practice to improving the health of our communities by delivering the highest quality patient-centered care in a setting of active innovation and education. And you're going to see how the two of them have put their minds together and their talents together. Now, let me just say a word about our moderator, Linda Pizzuti Henry. I have to first say we're very proud that she's an MIT alumna. Hooray. And she's the managing director of the Boston Globe. She's co-founder of Hub Week, which is an annual collaboration among regional institutions that explores the intersection of art, science, and technology. She's founder of the Boston Public Market, and I have to tell you, there are dozens and dozens of community-focused activities that she has made to happen and fostered. She has been a real champion of our community. So um, it's an incredible privilege to have these three amazing women with us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to their conversation. I know you will be looking, for, you're looking forward to their conversation. And at the bottom of it is, how do we make mammography is diagnostic power even greater so we can save lives. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Linda, Regina, and Connie. Come on up. Get started. Okay. Well, good evening, and um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm so excited about this time that we have together. Um, we have an incredible problem uh, with breast cancer. It is amazing and staggering when we look at the numbers. I'm sure if I ask for a raise of hands of how many of you have been touched by breast cancer, either yourself, a family member, a friend, and the hands all go up. Um, we all have. And, um, and out of the two billion adult women who are of screening age, over two million are diagnosed every single year worldwide. Over two million women every single year being diagnosed with breast cancer. And globally, over 600,000 die year after year after year. It is really staggering. We all agree on a lot. There are some areas that we get into, especially when we're trying to be innovative, where people have a lot of disagreements. But every person that I talk to 
emphasizes that we cannot continue to look at late stage disease treatment. It is both costly and ineffective. We must be better at identifying breast cancer early when it can be cured. But we are missing two key ingredients to that paradigm of early detection and cure of breast cancer. We simply don't have accurate tools to predict who will and won't get breast cancer. And we don't have accurate tools to identify cancer early. Now we think that we do. We talk about all the different tests that we have out there, the genetic tests, the, the screening mammography, the new tools, automated ultrasound, MRI. But I want to share a little bit about how these are failing and what we need to do and the power of AI to address our greatest challenges. Breast cancer impacts so many women, um, and it has been doing this for decades and decades, young and old, all races, all walks of life, an incredible array of women, and when you look at them collectively, you realize how far we need to go to change the face of breast cancer. Each of these faces are so unique, and also what we're discovering, that every mammogram of every woman is also unique. When we look at mammograms, we can tell as if that was the woman's thumbprint so much about that individual. And we've never leveraged this before AI. We've never actually taken all of that digital information in every woman's mammogram and leveraged that information to predict the future and to assess more accurately, does this woman have cancer? What type of cancer is it? Will she have cancer in the future? And you know, this is something that all of us have talked about in the clinical setting. If I'm reading mammograms and a, a technologist accidentally puts the, another woman's mammogram up in a collection of, of um, my patients, I'll know that it's not the same patient. I can look at the different ones and say, well, this, this belongs to someone else. So we've sort of known that, but we didn't have the tools to really extract that incredibly rich data out of the mammogram. People have noticed this for a long time. Uh, someone that Regina and I like to read about is John Wolfe. He's still alive, so I really think we need to invite him out for lunch or dinner and talk to him and say how much we appreciate that early on he was noticing this, he was writing about it, and everyone thought he was crazy. Um, I remember when I was in my early training and I asked about Wolfe and his patterns of the mammogram, they're like, oh, that was all debunked. He didn't know what he was talking about. Um, but what he said in 1967 was normal and abnormal parenchymal elements are noted, and he was really looking at all of the data besides just is there cancer or not, but these alveolar tissue and ducts, what's their distribution? And he said this material was coded and later subjected to analysis by computer. And I would love for him to see just how forward thinking that was and what we're doing now in this same domain. Um, we could also laugh with John Wolfe because Regina will talk a little bit about some of the challenges we've had in getting our innovative thinking published and the rounds that we've done with their Journal of Radiology, which is considered the highest um, impact journal within the imaging sciences. If you can't get into radiology, you go to AJR. So I know when I see this paper, when his first in the 60s was in radiology, and this next one in 1976 was in AJR, radiology did not accept this paper, which they thought was crazy. Because what he said was maybe breast pa patterns can be an index of risk for developing cancer. He thought he was seeing something with his eye. He thought he was noticing something in his practice, and everyone thought he was crazy. Maybe one of the reasons why they thought he was crazy is because they were so excited about the technology. And they, it was like an arms race. Who can build the better, faster, smarter mammography machine? And we saw incredible advances going from zero mammography. I'm so glad I don't have to read the mammogram on the far left, but that's what um, people were reading, to film screen to mammography to digital mammography. But what we found was our advances in imaging technology outpaced our human ability to process the information that was provided. And yet we just kept collecting more data with our equipment. So now we have tomosynthesis. For any single woman, she could easily have 200 images that as a breast imager, I need to sort through looking for a cancer. These, there's thin slices through the breast. Each view of the breast is about 50 images in an average sized breast a woman. So think about the challenge that we present to humans to find six cancers out of more than 200,000 images. Now I say it's challenging, but it's actually 
ridiculous. This is not a feat that we should have humans be doing. This is a feat that we should be having highly intelligent computers doing. This first level of screening mammograms, the 200,000 images, let's have computers read that and let's have humans work on then conversations with patients, calling them back, biopsying them, talking them through their cancer diagnosis, doing the things that physicians can do well and allowing computers to do the things that they can't. And we've all known this to be true. Um, I did a very large study of a breast cancer surveillance consortium, hundreds of millions of mammograms, thousands of radiologists, and what we find is there is wide human variation in mammographic interpretation. So that we know that 40% of US certified breast imagers are not meeting the criteria that are set. And we give people a lot of latitude. In fact, the requirements for cancers diagnosed per thousand mammograms is as long as you're finding two and a half cancers per thousand and above. So on these graphs, what I'm showing is you have radiologists that can read thousands of mammograms and find six cancers out of every thousand or five, that's pretty average, but it's okay if they're only finding two. And in fact, some are reading here that we did in this huge study and they would find one. In other words, they're missing a lot of cancers. There's no performance of mammography. There are these wide error bars. We can talk about recall rates or sensitivity. How good is mammography at picking up cancers? It depends on the human, and we want to change that. We don't want this to be tied to that human variation. Sensitivity of mammography average is 80%, but we have people that it's 30%, and we have others that it's 95%, these wide error bars in performance in this domain. And we talk about it amongst ourselves. We talk about the fact that um, in about 30% of cases, when you identify a cancer, you can see it in the year before, when you look back. We talk about in our false negative mammograms, when the mammogram is read as negative, but sometime during that year, the woman feels a lump or identifies something, goes into the doctor and has cancer diagnosed, when we look back at that negative mammogram again, 30% will say, we actually can see something. This is an example. This was read as uh, negative. And, um, but in hindsight, we can see this spot. Now, why did a human miss this? Because for breast imagers, you look at this and you say, actually, I, I can see that cancer. It's that little white spot. There's a human reading hundreds of mammograms, going through, gets distracted. It looks like the other tissue. It is not something, again, for hundreds of thousands of images looking for six cancers that's well suited to humans. So the government has tried as much as they can to help us with very good intentions. We have a Mammography Quality Standard Act to improve the performance by radiologists. The standards that are set for us are higher than any other field in radiology. We have to read a certain number, which is not required in other areas. We have to take CME. We have to audit our practices to know how good are we at what we do, how many times do we miss cancers, how many times do we have false positives. And then more recently, the government also said, let's share information with women. Let's make sure they know their breast density. So what about that? I'm going to now shift over and, and sort of bring us um, to the transition over to Regina by asking the basic question, can computers read mammograms better than humans? We think that they can. In fact, we know that they can. The first question, and this is going to be an audience participation. I like that how people raise their hands before, so pay attention because this is all the education you're going to get. These are mammograms of different density. White means dense, and the grayish is not so dense. So these last two are very dense. Turns out that radiologists don't do a very good job of this. We did a large study of, 85 radio, of 83 radiologists. At one end of the spectrum, the radiologist said, I think 6% of mammograms are dense, and the other end, they thought that 85% were dense and everything in between. So this is the information that the government is asking that we share with all women. So we developed a model um, that had 97% agreement with expert readers and 94% agreement in the clinic. Um, this has been implemented and we're using it now and every patient that comes through Mass General for their mammogram has their density assessed with this um, MGH MIT deep learning model. This is the sorting that one would do. You have all these different mammograms and we're asking the um, models to sort them out depending on how they were assessed. I'm putting the fatty ones, the gray to the left, and the dense ones to the right. This is a confusion matrix and I want you just to look at these patterns. Reader one sorted these mammograms into columns. Reader two sorted them in 
two rows. And so look at these patterns and which look more similar to you, the columns or the rows? Which do you think was the machine and which do you think was the human? This is where there's agreement. Both reader one and reader two said that the upper left was fatty and the lower right was dense, and that makes sense. That's what they look like. But these are disagreements. Um, one said dense and the other one said, I don't, I don't think it's dense. So the model is the columns, that's the computer, and the rows are the radiologists. You can see the variation by the humans and the consistency by the models. It was giving this feedback to our radiologists that had them accept using AI in the clinic because there is a lot of resistance. The more they got this feedback, the more they realized, oh, there is human variation. I don't know what I was thinking that day, but I was wrong, maybe my finger slipped, I don't know. And so that is why at MGH, we have our radiologists that are supported both in the infrastructure that we've built and the tools that we have to integrate seamlessly the AI assessments into their clinical practice. It doesn't increase their time, they're not working at separate computers, it's been integrated into the standard clinical flow. We're now ready to launch this into other areas. Regina's going to talk about our other models, but we've built a platform where all images at MGH are pulled into a PAX or an archiving system, run through an IT application, through a model, and then back through into our EPIC and our reporting system. And finally, the final question, the first step to independent reading, where we actually get to the point where it's computers reading our mammograms, not humans, is our one-year triage model, where we are showing right out of the gate, giving this model very little information, not the prior mammograms, not the advanced homosynthesis mammograms, just the basic 2D mammograms. We're showing that we can identify those mammograms with a high likelihood of having cancers, and we can identify those mammograms that were human red false positives. We are already at a point with our computers where we are performing better than many, many radiologists certified in the US to read, radio to read mammograms, and we're truly just getting started. So um, I couldn't be luckier to have been recruited to Boston to have one of the men at Mass General that recruited me say, you have to meet my patient who's just finished her treatment. Her name's Regina Barzillay, and she's spectacular. And then I'm like one little T-stop away on the red line from Regina, her lab, all that MIT has to offer is something that um, was beyond my wildest imagination when I made this move from Seattle to Boston and couldn't be more proud also of my team back home at MGH uh, that's open and excited and enthusiastic about how we can do more for our patients in the future. So I'm going to turn it over to Regina and thanks for your time. Yeah. Okay, I will try to shout. I'm an MIT professor, so I can try to shout. I'm teaching one of the biggest machine learning classes, and it's a big class. So at any rate, <laughs> so it's really my pleasure to be here. And I remember a few years back at the time that uh, Kony and I met, I also came to this particular place. and met a number of people and told them, you know, guys, you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to show you the way. <laughs> uh, so you can see that I was totally obnoxious. I came just uh, from across the building. And I started my journey into this area. And while Connie focused on talking about how machine can help radiologists to do better job that they are already doing, the question that I personally cared about is to use AI to solve questions that humans cannot really do. So for instance, here you can see two breasts. Both of these breasts do not have cancer, okay? And I don't know if there are any more radiologists besides Connie in the audience, but we tried it on many expert breast radiologists. They cannot say which one of these breasts are likely to get cancer. They can say there is no cancer now, but they cannot really assess what's to come in the next two or three years. And this is a question that I really cared about. So now let's think how humans are thinking about risk. So the way humans think today about risk, because there is a lot of uh, research in this area, is they start by thinking what can be correlating with the risk of cancer. So uh, for instance, for breast cancer, it may be your family history, your BRCA status, 
your breast density. So you're going to think about various factors, combine them with a statistical model, and you're going to get a prediction. Now, uh, I'm sure not many of you remember what is area under the curve, which is in this case 0 0.6, but it pretty much tells you how accurate is the model. Let me give you the ranges. If you totally do random guesses, you're going to get 0 0.5. If you are perfect, you're going to get one. So you can see that the model that is currently used today for predicting who needs uh, extra screening, who can be on chemo prevention, they are closer to random than to one. And uh, the question is, can we actually do a better job? And I know that many women in this room who are getting their mammography uh, you know, yearly, are getting this letter that comes back home and tells them, you know, you have high density, you are in increased risk of breast cancer and so on and so forth, and now it became a federal law. Now, let's look at how predictive is this indicator, because we are telling somebody you should be worried. So if you're looking at non-dense women, if you look at the cohort of mammogram, you would find six out of thousand cancers. If you're a dense woman, you are the one who got the letter, it's eight out of 1,000. Today, we are sending 42% of patients with a letter that they should be worried. Now, I will tell you my personal story. Uh, so this is me diagnosed in 2014, and this is me in 2013, and this is me in 2012. And uh, you know what's interesting about 2012? When I went to do my first mammogram, they saw that I have a dense breast. And they told me, you know, you shouldn't worry about it. You're going to get this letter. But it doesn't matter, because 40% of women are getting these letters. Uh, so this is the type of information, the risk assessment that we are giving to the woman. And uh, the question that I thought about is forget about using human to predict the risk factors. Our capacity to identify patterns is very limited because it's like, you know, the dogs have better sense of smells than we do. The same way, you know, machines can remember many more pixels that we would ever be able to do. So the question for me was, if I am going to get a very large cohort of mammograms, let's say for 50,000 patients, for 100,000 patients, and I would know for each one of these images what happened to this uh, woman in two years or in five years. Can a machine discriminate the pattern that human eye cannot really discriminate? And uh, the technology that we use is a deep learning technology, the same technology that recognizes your face, you know, when you uh, uh, have the new iPhones. So this is a deep learning model. It pretty much takes a, an image. I think it's a dog here. Uh, it takes the image of a dog, which machine sees just, you know, as a matrix of zeros and ones. There's many different non-linear transformation on this image in such a way that it correctly predicts the label. It has the image, it has the label, and it tries to adjust all these wires to predict the correct, uh, uh, the correct assessment. And what's interesting about these models, in contrast to what we are as human are thinking, when we are thinking we need to tell the machine what is the right pattern, that's what Dr. Wolf was trying to do. He was saying, if you see more white or this white, it's predictive of future cancer. Here, we are not telling it to the machine. We are giving the machine the input and the output and let it figure it out. And if you're not convinced, I want to give you an example from another area which has nothing to do with breast cancer. Whenever you are training the machine to predict, to recognize faces, okay, again, you give to it an image and the label. And what happens, you would see that without ever teaching the machine explicitly about the eyes and the ears and the nose, through the layers, you can identify increasingly complex patterns. The first layers of the network, the one in the very bottom, would recognize as very simple lines. When you go one layer higher, the machine would identify bigger subparts, ears and nose and so on, until it recognizes the whole face. So this is quite remarkable. So we want to take all this power and you use it to identify these very subtle patterns in the breast tissue to predict future risk. So we collected with Connie, Connie led this part of work, all the patients that we had uh, for whom we knew the outcomes, and we trained two models. One model took the breast and predicted five-year outcome, uh, and another model used the image and some risk factors, so for instance, BRCA. And this is kind of surprising, because you say, what can you learn from the image? Can you actually learn something, even if you don't tell the model how old is the woman, did she ever had cancer in her family, and so on. So let's see how it works. You can see the green one is image alone, and the 
yellow one is image plus risk factor. So you can see it helps, but it already does pretty reasonable. Now, I would tell you more what it means, but I just want to show you one graph that was the most striking graph for me and for Connie when we did this research. We actually wanted to stratify the population and to see how the model does for different classes of subpopulation. And what we've seen here, that our model, uh, the yellow one, sustains good performance for different uh, races. What you can see is that the model, which is called Tara Cusick, which is currently in clinical use in many hospitals in this city, actually performs below random on African-American population, but not enough below random that you can actually switch it. So, and uh, Connie and I met uh, uh, Dr. Cusick like a few months ago, and we asked him about it. Do you know that your model, which is currently used according to which you can get tamoxifen, a scheme of preventative, that it performs so badly on, on such a big um, subset of population. He said, yes, of course I know, because this model was developed on white women from 50 to 70 in London. <laughs> so you can really see what's, uh, that these models, not only that they're not very powerful, they also are quite biased. And coming back to Connie's point, that what we've discovered, that of course there is a correlation between the risks that our model predicts and um, the density, but they are not the same. You can see that there are some women who have high risk and low density, and women who have low risk and high density, so they don't totally and fully correlate. So that's why you know the recent law that was just um, uh, developed in, um, actually no, accepted by, and. Um, signed up by our President Trump, actually goes based on the science that was developed in 1967. That's where the Wolf Density paper came out. At any rate, but I want to give you some more intuitive understanding of how this model works. And I showed you the model for two years outcome. So what you can see here, this is uh, the docile, so for instance, this is top 10% of the patients in the model predicted high risk. You can see that 40% of the cancers fell into this category. If you look top 20%, 60% of the cancers happen to be here. At the same time, if you look at the bottom 40%, these women have very, very low chance of getting breast cancer. So what you can imagine may be happening when we move forward, that we can do the first mammogram. Uh, assess the risk and then create personalized screening depending on your particular tissue. Either you look really suspicious and you may need MRI and other things, or maybe it's okay if you're coming every uh, two or three years for screening. And what I wanted to say, I don't know how many of you know this story. This is a woman called Nancy Capello uh, from New Jersey. In 2003, she came and did her mammogram. Her mammogram was fine. Within, I think, a month, uh, she found a lump, and she was diagnosed with a metastatic breast cancer. Uh, when her mammogram came out, uh, fine. And at that moment, this woman realized that um, you know, there is something wrong with the process. She was a high, uh, she had high density and nobody told her that her mammogram may not be very predictive and maybe she needed an additional screening. So what she did, she actually decided to reach out and uh, to, uh, uh, to her state government and to change the law which requires the providers to tell women that they have high density. And even in states like Connecticut and New Jersey, you can get a supplemental screening from your insurance based on this information. And I really applaud her for what she did, despite you know, her own unfortunate circumstances. But what I feel we should be doing now is to move to the best science to help women. And today, the deep learning models, like the one we developed with Kony, actually are much more accurate. They are bias-free, and they are consistent. Um, and uh, those are the papers. Now I want to take three minutes and tell you how did I get to this research because we had a conversation with Linda prior to our, um, uh, you know, to, to prepare for this event and she told that one should share stories. So I'm going to tell you some stories. Okay. So before, so I, uh, I got tenure at MIT when uh, Susan was a president and my core research is in natural language processing and I work on a variety to of topics like for instance, we developed the first model which took uh, dead language like Ugaritic and fully automatically deciphered it using Hebrew Bible. We taught the machine to play civilization, uh, reading manuals in natural language to play better. So a variety of uh, fun things, okay, uh, I had fun. And then in 2000, 
uh, 14 in April. It's actually the April, five years ago. I was diagnosed at the end of April with breast cancer. And this is the um, spring vacation when my son and I went to Florida. And within a month, uh, I, I was diagnosed, and this is him in July when I was already you know, doing my chemo and, and he had to cut my hair because I couldn't do it myself. At any rate, you know, I went through the treatment, uh, all was fine. And then I came back to MIT. And when I came back to MIT, after really seeing human suffering at MGH and rethinking completely, is it like the best use of my time, my time to do your critic or civilization or other things? I was totally confused. And I remember this was the biggest confusion of my life. You see, my hair is curly, because that's how it comes after chemo. And I was just thinking, what can I do to change it? Because what I felt that we have such an amazing technology that we are developing in computer science and AI lab here, but it really doesn't go to MGH. And I was trying to find a place how I can contribute. And I went from office to office. So part of it was coming to, to Cork and say that they don't know what they're doing. But the second part, I was going from office to office at MGH and saying, you know, I don't need any money. I can do machine learning. Uh, can I help you? And uh, in most cases, the answer was, thank you very much. We're doing great. Uh, and then I found Connie, and then we started our work. And I remember that. It was very funny. I had to give a talk, which is like a big plenary talk in my area, in a big conference. And it's like once in your lifetime you give this talk. And I was thinking, what do I want to talk about to my community, to my research community? And so I cannot talk about anything else. I want to talk to them, that they have to do what I am trying to do, to use technology to help patients. Uh, and I d gave this talk, and it was kind of uh, you know, amazing. People were saying it was such a great talk. I was so happy. And I said, wow, this is great. Then, then the reality hit. So we submitted some proposals uh, to uh, NCI and other agencies. And I wrote in the proposal, you know, I'm a breast cancer survivor. I know what needs to be done. Uh, you know, and I want to make sure that the technology comes to the patients. So I was sure, you know, it was that I can write proposals. My proposals almost never rejected. I wrote this plea, and I was sitting there and waiting, you know, millions to come. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, all my proposals were rejected. Uh, uh, we were, Connie and I were trying to get access to data. You know, typically I never wear a suit, but because I don't really know anybody, uh, unless they are not in computer science department, wear a suit. So, so I was wearing suit and meeting a lot of different officials at MGH, and we couldn't get the data. It was just terrible. And I remember I was reading these reviews, and you know, we are talking about 2016, and people were asking, why are you using neural deep learning models? Why are you not using something else? They were thinking, if these people just read New York Times, they would know the answer. So it was just unbelievable. And then I realized that it's a bigger problem, because if you look, for instance, this is a DOD breast cancer panel, who is missing here? There is no computer scientist. Computer science three years ago and AI were not part of the story at all. So obviously, these people cannot read my proposals. At any rate, uh, and, and I don't know how many of you read this book, Americana. I highly recommend. And there is this place where uh, this woman describes how uh, you know, um, she, she couldn't sort of legally work, and she kind of goes from, from place to place, and everybody hears, and it sounds good, and nobody gives her money. This was me. I mean, I read this book, and they said, this is me. And then uh, what we've done, so Connie and I didn't stop. This was the point. That we decided we're not stopping here. So I gave some humongous amounts of talks all over the world. Uh, I met with any person who said they want to talk to me. I said, fine, I will find time for you. We wrote a lot of non-federal uh, proposals, and we tried to get some publicity while we continue doing our research. And I should say that I'm really grateful for people from Cork who really helped us. Among the first grants that we got was a bridge project grant from Cork. Um, Susan uh, and Phil really um, help us to negotiate a variety of different complex interactions with various agencies and MGH. So there were people who started helping us and who start moving things along. And um, I have to tell you the last funny story. So um, I, I was participating in some podcasts in Washington Post, and when they were putting like makeup and beautifying, um, 
there was some guy sitting near me, and the guy asked me, what are you doing? I said, yeah, I'm a professor of computer science, and he asked, why are you here? Because it was about cancer, so I told him, you know, I came to tell to all these people that they really should be using machine learning. They really don't know what they're doing. People in NCI are clueless. And I'm going on and on and on. They finished my makeup. And at that point, I say, oh, I'm really sorry that I, you know, I kind of have my tea way very, very intense. I say, I'm really sorry. I'm sure you have nothing to do with it. Um, uh, OK, who can recognize the guy? I mean, it's, yes. He's the director of the NCI. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so then he told me that he actually has a lot to do with it. So we made a picture. But it was, uh, it was really funny. And any rate, uh, and he's still uh, the director of NCI. <laughs> Uh, so, but you know, and then with the time, you know, we got uh, enough funding to do our research, so we're doing well. I am now in the data science advisory board to the NCI director. <laughs> uh, we have images from multiple hospitals, and we are really spreading it across the country. And the part that I am really most excited about is that to whatever tools we developed besides writing paper, we really clinically implemented them at MGH. So everybody who does their mammograms at MGH have them read by our tools, and I hope that we will spread it to partners and other institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was, those were both extraordinary presentations. No? Am I on now? Sorry. Those were both, extra can you hear me? We're good? Um, those are both extraordinary presentations. And what I love is, so many things about it that I love about how you're changing things, but that this is an unusual collaboration um, that you are making ha happen. And it so represents, I love that we're sitting here in the Coke it's an institute talking about it because that's so much of what the Koch Institute stands for, is this integrative approach to finding ways to battle cancer. And um, so you, you are a living example of, of what the Koch Institute stands for. So thank you for having us here. Uh, where this is a perfect setting for this conversation. Um, so you, we heard your side of the story uh, about her saying that you're, everybody in this industry is doing it wrong. Um, how did you feel when she approached you? Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, exactly. I was, um, you know, I was incredibly excited because my career had always been seeing the problem, chipping away at it, making a little bit of a dent, either the work in Uganda or other countries where you just don't have radiologists, or the, um, the patients that we have that would come in with a palpable lump that had had a negative mammogram. Mm. And so there are just all of these problems where we were chipping, chipping away. And then I had Regina come in with saying, I have these tools I think can help. I, I have something I think could be really powerful. And once we started the discussion, it also really impressed me. I've always thought if you get like-minded people that have the same vision, have the same mission, have the same tenacity, they can do great things. And that's what impressed me both, most about Regina. She was in it for all the right reasons. She wanted to help patients. Um, and that, that was uh, pretty extraordinary. Of course, having, um, you know, when people, I, uh, trainees and residents often say, now tell me the difference between a sponsor and a mentor. And I was like, okay, look up sponsor, you're gonna see Susan Hockfield, because she <laughs> knows what that means. When she says, I see these two women, I wanna support them, I wanna help them, and I'm gonna figure that out. So it was really a spectacular process. And so what you walked us through here was really incredibly persuasive. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room would rather have their uh, would, would prefer to have any sort of screening read by AI to just have this database. One of the things that you talked about is how the, you have the training from looking at thousands and thousands of images over your career that you, things pop out to you, that you're able to see it. And the same thing happened with, with the woman who discovered um, the CTI injuries in the brain, that you, you were just able to see these patterns. You, you heard this and you said, that's not good enough. 
Um, I do appreciate and Connie reads my mammograms, you know, <laughs> every year together with the machine. But I think that it's not about, you know, who is better. We have really challenging task in front of us, trying to predict. And, and what we've had, I want to reiterate statistics from Connie's presentation, 30% of breast cancer, one year were growing mm. in the breast because they were not identified. And we're even talking about top uh, institutions. So the question is, can we put machine and human together to do it better? And we all know that, you know, and they've been to the room where Connie read these mammograms, you know, it's eight hours, you're just looking at images. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure each one of you can think about part of the day when you're just tired or you want to make a phone call or you need a cup of coffee and you just lose this concentration. So if machine can help human to do their job better, I think we all will benefit. And furthermore, we can ask machine questions that humans cannot answer, like mm -hmm. predicting the risk. Predictive and the question that I'm asking myself, and Connie is asking the same question, let's say now we are putting into the clinical implementation this uh, model that predict risk. Model can actually tell you where it looked at when it identified risk, but the pattern is so complex that human cannot comprehend it. So how do you decide, how do you walk in this world where machine in some ways mm -hmm. are smarter than us? Because it doesn't mean you can open the black box, you can, you can make it white box, it would show you what it's seen, but the human still may not be able to understand it. And th there is, even with AI, there is still a really important human ele element, which I've heard you identify, Connie, where there's a human trust. And you yourself played an, a really important role in showing that computer-aided, um, what is it called, uh, the CAD, computer-aided detection radiology, was not effective because the, the element of human trust is so important. So can you tell us a little bit about that story and what you learned from that to help with what you're working on today? Right, and so one of the things that Regina and I are excited about is not repeating the mistakes of the past. So computer-aided diagnosis, computer-aided detection has been around in mammography for decades. Um, it was a very different approach. Rather than the um, approach that Regina explained where you give lots of images and say the outcome and the, and the deep learning is going to learn that, instead we would segment the breast. We would, we would say this is what a cancer looks like. These are what calcifications look like. This is what a mass looks like. And we would teach those features and then run the mammograms through and it would flag and highlight like look at this, look at that, what about that? Well it turned out when those products came out and they were really, the companies were rushing to get them to market, um, they put marks on all the mammograms. So we had radiologists with lots of false positives. They you know maybe that's something, maybe that's something. So then the company said well let's try to filter that down. Don't make so many marks. If it's really obvious we won't have to put a mark on it. When we actually studied what happened when radiologists used that all across the country, they performed worse with this assistance than without. And that was something that people were pretty upset with me for publishing um, because there had been a whole industry that had been created around this. People were billing for it, they were collecting for it. And um, so that was um, an unpleasant story. It was an uncomfortable story. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's the power of science and research and and information um, to guide people's best practices. So we don't want to repeat that. We know a lot of the study designs that were done, although they were accepted in journals that will reject us, <laughs> the, the study designs were pretty sloppy. They were reader studies. They were highly, highly biased um, data samples that wouldn't translate over into routine clinical practice. So we're paying a lot of attention to those lessons and we're really determined not to repeat them. Regina, you've talked about how there's, this is another aspect of medicine that you think is broken, which is the clinical trials. Can you talk about how, why you think they're broken and what we can do about it? So thank you for bringing it up. This is my other favorite topic, <laughs> is the question of you know, how the information is used today in medicine. Because if you go to Amazon, to Google, to any company that deals with data, they would use every single piece of data that they can put their hands on. Now, if you look at cancer, cancer care today, and I took the statistics from American Society of Clinical Oncology, if you want to check it, um, 
they claim that today all the clinical decisions are based on 3% of the population that participate in clinical trials. So it's not random. It's not random. It's not random, but it's only 3%. People who said... Uh, it's it's yeah. just why 97% each one of us went to the doctor, something happened to us. There is a clear outcome, given how different we all are. Machine or humans should be learning from all the information, not only for a small, non-randomly selected subset. And one of the shocks of mine when I, you know, start kind of understanding how it is done in cancer clinic at MGH was the fact that if you want to use retrospective data about the patients, actually there is a fellow, which is a clinician, who needs to sit down to extract this information by hand into the database and then run the statistics. Clearly, you cannot do it on thousands of people, they can write a paper which will have 200 uh, samples of retrospective data, and it just looked to me totally bizarre because in no other industries that I work with, people have this type of practice. There are tools to do it automatically. Why we're not doing it automatically? Cancer registries in the whole country, they're done by hand. They're not done automatically as it's done again everywhere. And there is really not much value by doing this by hand, it delays it, it introduces mistake, it increases cost. So how I envision it moving forward that we can really utilize the data for every single patient that went through the clinic and uh, we can adjust their treatment accordingly. So this gives us an opportunity to fix, there was, you talked about the, how the model didn't work for African American women, but there's a real opportunity here with AI because you're dealing with such such a huge amount of data and so many more um, points of information of correcting this. What are some of the ways that you anticipate this correcting the discrimination that's built in in the past? You know, I think one of the, um, we had a lot of highlights. We've had some highs and lows on this whole journey, but <laughs> sure. one of the highs was we were invited to give um, the keynote addresses at a national um, conference for breast cancer centers. And we shared our experience, you know, what we've discovered and what we're doing. And it was it was a little bit like being at a rock concert. I mean, people came up afterwards, they were hugging us, they were thanking us. They were like, what can we do to be part of this? We just had a phone call the other day with a group in Chicago and a group in Wisconsin that heard us there and said, you know, we have over 200,000 mammograms that we run every year. We want to provide this, we want to study, we want to be part of this, what can we do? One of my former trainees in Seattle now runs a gigantic, um, many hundreds of thousands mammogram program in California. He's like, we're all in, we're in this, we wanna do this. And it feels like there's a real groundswell um, of people saying, we know it's been broken, we know we've tried to say, well, there's a better technology coming out, or now we're gonna do something a little bit different, sort of these incremental changes, but they know it's broken, and now that they see something that they could be part of that would really be a lot larger. So I think that's what's gonna happen. I think people are going to want to be part of this, and they're going to see the value of it. We're gonna work through all the challenges, but I think, I think there are so many people out there that wanna do this, and th those that don't, or those institutions that can't figure it out, they won't. I think there'll be so many that will, um, that will move forward. What's extraordinary is you were talking a little bit about the numbers of mammograms out there. According to the FDA, there are more than 39 million mammograms performed annually. And so if you think about the number of radiology, and we've been excited, you showed the progression from, from the quality of the imaging, the technology side, but that we've really just been relying on, on the, the training of the radiologists for this. And what the potential is, if you have 39 million every year to really synthesize and learn. Um, it brings me to the, the question of when we, there's a full spectrum when we think of, of cancer. There's predicting risk, there's the early identification, and there's treatment. Where do you think AI has the biggest potential impact on this whole spectrum? We, we see the, the full spectrum, you know, from, from the um, identifying those at risk, being able then to not just predict any cancer, but the specific types of cancer, and then have prevention strategies that work. So for example, if we can predict this woman is at risk for an ER negative tumor, mm -hmm. why put that woman on tamoxifen that will block ER positive receptors and all the morbidity associated with that? There would be a different prevention strategy based on the type of cancer that woman is at risk for. So there's a whole domain in there. 
we've shown the early detection, more targeted therapies, more personalized care. Um, what we wanted to do was in some ways have proof of principle early on. So we got engagement from clinicians saying, we see the value, we want to use this, we have it in our clinics, now let's build upon this. Because we felt like that would be the biggest hurdle, just being comfortable with having it in the clinic as part of routine clinical care. Uh, Susan has talked about the importance of bringing down barriers to getting these things forward. You're really good at identifying barriers. <laughs> um, there's, we, we talked about clinical trials, but you've identified the FDA as another barrier. So I think uh, FDA in some case is still, you know, kind of lens what is the right way to engage and how these tools need to be regulated. The place where I see one of the biggest barriers to bring AI, uh, and I'm not talking about like MIT AI, but I'm talking, you know, the whole army of people who are getting into AI, is uh, the lack of data. So as you just mentioned, the number of mammograms <coughs> available in the country. So I think the biggest, the biggest collection of mammograms that is available for public use was collected before digital mammography. It was films. And it was done, I think, in the 80s or 90, early 90s. Uh, and it has maybe 70,000 mammograms. So you can say, how come all this data getting generated and we don't have one collection on which everybody, any hacker in this country, can just try it and build the models? You know, Again, while we are obnoxious MIT professors, <laughs> I can totally recognize that there are people who in this area will be much better than me and can do better stuff or can do different stuff. And as you've said both, that we can ask different questions. But today, this resource just doesn't exist. And it's not only the case for breast cancer, it's the case for many, many other cancers. Today, the data is held uh, within the institutions and nothing is you know, shared with researchers who actually can benefit and build better model. To me, this is the biggest hurdle today. Mm. Well, for the AI to get broadly adopted, we need to have the right regulatory environment, what you're talking about, but we also need the right pay structure. Um, how do we make sure that, how do we change the pay structure to incentivize clinics to adopt this? I think that we are, this is one of the barriers for more rapid implementation. So there are companies with AI and healthcare and they're looking at different models expecting that we would have left fee-for-service behind us, but we haven't. So if you're not in a fee-for-service and you want to have the highest quality, most efficient care possible, if you're in fee-for-service, you want to make money every time you do an exam, whether it, whether it improves the life of the patient or not. I think the AI can be helpful in both domains. So if I'm running a large hospital fee for service, I'm not going to be able to keep up with my competitor across the street that has an AI reading mammograms rather than paying those expensive radiologists to read all those mammograms. So that that is going to be one method. And then if I'm a Kaiser Permanente that's looking to be more targeted, more precise, that these women should get mammograms every two years, these should get them every year, these need an MRI, that's going to help me as well on my higher quality, lower cost. How, though, the government starts to have the CPT codes and the billing and all of that with each of these, that's going to be something we'll have to keep working on. We can, again, look back at the history of CAD. Um, lobbyists successfully convinced Congress to pay $18 every time we pushed a button to have a CAD overlay on the mammogram. It didn't have value, but everyone was doing it because they could push the button and make $18. Over time, that dropped and dropped and dropped. Now, there's really no added payment for CAD, it's all bundled into the mammogram. But that was a 20-year story of, from my perspective, uh, you know, people figured out how to get paid for it. Did it really provide value? It didn't. So we'll have to figure that out. I have a lot more questions, but I want to share um, this with the audience. So I think we have some runners here with microphones. If other people in the audience, I'm sure, have questions, there's some this side of the room. Oh, one here. This is fantastic research. I was wondering um, how applicable this has been to other populations, such as younger women, older women, men who might get breast cancer, and how it might be applicable to other kinds of cancers that might have <coughs> patterns that could be recognized and whatnot. Thank you. We've been very excited about taking exactly this model and applying it to lung cancer. For us, that would be the next because the, the domain is the same. You have CT screening um, that has been shown to reduce 
um, lung cancer mortality and all-cause mortality. So you have images, you have different risk factors that you can assess, and then you can um, have algorithms trained to do a better job going through those hundreds of thousands of CT slices and images trying to find those small cancers. Um, there's other domains as, as well. In some ways, pap smears and cervical cancer, of course, there's a whole domain where now vaccinations are going to have dramatically uh, reduced uh, cervical cancer. But in that domain, they already have been having computers read the pap smears. So in some ways, we can look back and say, well, we had that model. We used to have humans looking at the pap smears, and then computers did. So how do we just keep doing that with any of the imaging that we have? But, but let me just add, we actually, in addition to stratifying the model by race, we stratified it for a variety of different areas, the aging, the menopausal status, and the model seemed to be pretty robust across different subpopulations. And uh, in addition to just uh, predicting cancer, uh, Connie and I now are starting collaboration uh, uh, in the area. May I say it? It's not cancer, may I? Even though we're in COVID. <laughs> um, to actually predicting uh, the heart attacks because uh, the, this is actually the killer of women way before the breast cancer. And apparently looking at the mammogram, you can predict the, the risk of uh, heart disease because of the calcifications. Uh, so we have a collaborator uh, who studied this question and moving forward, you don't only want to do a single read on the mammogram, but you want to predict all other conditions where the signs of it are there. So the way I envision myself healthcare or MGH partners and other places moving forward, is that whenever you do any scan or any test, you're not only evaluating for the disease that initiated the scan, but you're changing probability distribution over all different diseases. And in addition to lung, uh, I don't know if Phil Sharp is still here, uh, but uh, he actually was one of the initiators of a program in Stand Up to Cancer to do similar type of analysis for uh, pancreatic cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So we collected a very large uh, set of screens of people who were incidentally screened for, for like say, bellyache or accident or whatever, and some of them developed pancreatic cancer later. So the question is, can you early enough to detect who is likely to develop the disease? And we're in very early stages, but we can imagine what kind of potential it could be for this disease where today it's pretty much deadly when it is diagnosed. Uh, I, I imagine there's some kind of tension between building a really complicated neural net that treats everything as a special case and uh, just sort of a more general neural net. But if you have, if you, if you don't want to make some crazily complicated neural net, just a reasonable neural net to analyze this, is 70,000 images enough? Do you get a lot better with 200,000 images, with a million images? Or are these just complicated problems and the area under the curve will never be over 60%, 70%, 80%? So I think that we have, I would say, not overly complicated neural net. <laughs> it's fairly standard neural net. I mean, we do different things which are specific to this domain, but it's not something totally crazy uh, and unique. It's, you know, there, there is science to be done and we've done it. Um, I think the question that you're asking is how much data do we need and if we're increasing the data, we're gonna get better returns. And I think it really depends on the task. So for instance, breast, de breast density, which was our first product, you can train it well even on 15,000 images. Uh, if you're looking at the cancer detection, there we do see improvement. Because even if you have 200,000 mammograms, how many cancers would you have? 2,000 cancers, maybe? So you have highly unbalanced data set. And now we're getting 86, 87. I believe that if we can increase the size, we can do even better. I think that um, totally outperforming radiologists is just a matter of getting a bigger data set. Um, the question where I am not quite sure we, even with increase in size, we can improve if you look at what I demonstrated, the AUC for like, let's say two year prediction where it's a high 70s. Uh, I don't think that even the, the perfect risk model cannot be perfect because you know, within two years you may change your lifestyle, you can go to medication, you can lose weight, you, you can change a lot of things. So we're just talking about probabilities. 
So I think there it's not the matter of adding more images, it's a matter of adding other information. For instance, sequencing data, you know, blood work, variety of other things. And the beauty of this model is they actually combine all of this information to make predictions. There's another question. So MGH is using your tools on all the scans? So are there breast. Breast. All the breast scans? Are there other hospitals that are going to start using the tools as well? So currently, uh, we, um, uh, in the process of transferring the tool, we tried on data from Newton Wellesley, and we are moving now partners-wise uh, with Newton Wellesley and all the others outside of Boston. Um, uh, we, as Connie mentioned earlier, we are talking and they're kind of moving forward with this network advocate, Lutheran advocate, which is pretty big network in Midwest, uh, Detroit, Henry Ford and uh, Montefiore Hospital. So this is our immediate kind of network for expansion. And the way we are selecting the hospitals is first of all, they need to be large. So we have a lot of uh, test ground. They need to have a reasonable IT system. And we want hospitals which are really diverse in terms of their population. Very good. It's very exciting. Thank you. There was back. Question? Yeah. Do you update the tool that you're using at MGH with you know, a retrained data set or with more data, or is it just static right now? So uh, right now, the, the breast density, for instance, we're already outperforming humans. And whenever humans disagree with the system, they experience human actually uh, size with the machine. So for breast density, I don't see there is a point even to improve it further. Now, in terms of the cancer prediction and triaging, we are retraining the model pretty regularly. Um, and uh, as we move forward with uh, risk assessment, when the new data becomes available, we are retraining the model. So it's just a matter of the amount of compute when it, it runs you know, on the side. It's all automated. And that's one of the parts. Is the protocol for introducing the retrained model into actual clinical So in this case, I want to remind you that it's not instead of radiologists. It's just information that is given to radiologists, then they need to accept or reject and we record all this information. At the end, it is a radiologist's responsibility uh, about the final read. So we didn't uh, follow the exact procedure. It's a different level of um, control that you need to have when you're taking radiologists out of the reading or whether they are kind of collaborating together. I don't know where the microphone is. You can just talk about oh, it. Sure. Um, so question I had was, um, you had the earlier slide and you showed how from layer one to layer two, it started detecting eyes. Um, is there a way you could interrogate your model to see um, what kind of patterns it's detecting in the images? And in other words, is there new knowledge that, that we can learn from these models on the, what it's picking up? So this is a great question. Uh, in terms of what the model does. And uh, again, I want to tell you, it depends on the type of question. If you train the model to predict density, it will zoom in on the white pieces and do what you expect it to do. If you ask the model to predict cancer, it can again zoom in at certain parts of breast where there is cancer. The pattern here is clear. So whatever machine shows to you, uh, it's called attention mechanism, where the model attends to when it uh, trains. A human and machine can understand this is great. The uh, really um, gray area is when we are asking machine to make predictions that human cannot make. Uh, and I am pretty sure that if you even show it to the human and say, okay, there is, more, there is this pattern since our, I would say, I'm not sure what is politically correct, but cognitive capacity here is a bit limited in which patterns we can visually recognize. The fact that the machine illustrates it to you is not going to be really informative. And there is a lot of work in AI about how to make to make black boxes open, and it's a very valid, you know, valid question. And in some cases, when we can understand the explanation, of course, it's worth to provide this explanation. But there will be cases like this one when it's kind of not clear what that explanation will be. We have time for one more question. Hi, I'm uh, Ravi Khan. I'm a former mm, uh, microfabrication researcher here at MIT, and I just wanted to talk to the relevancy of what you're doing on behalf of a stranger I met uh, a couple years ago at the Boston Beer Works. We were both having a burger and a beer. 
I was going to go to a seminar in an hour. She was going to go downtown to the hospital to find out if uh, the treatment for her stage four metastatic breast cancer had been effective. And uh, what was more impactful than even that was that she told me that she had been going for regular screenings every year. And the way that she detected this cancer was just through her own, her own sense of touch. So on her behalf, I just wanted to mention the, rel the relevancy of what you're doing. Oh, thank you. That was very kind. And there are so many stories like that. You, too, are doing something really remarkable. Thank you. Thank you for your ingenuity and for what you're really making happen. Thank you to the Koch Center for having us here today. And thank all of you for coming and learning and, um, and having this discussion with us. Well, I'm going to end on one thing. Is there anything, what can we in this room do to help this? Is there anything we can do? <laughs> wow. Well, um, one, the engagement is fantastic for us. We certainly have benefited, as Regina said, when we needed to pursue other avenues that weren't the traditional NCI and Department of Defense. I can't tell you what it meant to me for my chairman and my department to see that people were interested in wanting to support what we were doing and to be able so to sort of start that up. That has been really incredible. Um, we can't wait for the next step, because the next step in having computers read mammograms that we're very excited about is sequential mammograms and tomosynthesis. We need bigger servers. We need bigger storage. We're working through all those pieces. Um, but we're barely scratching the surface on what we can accomplish. And to your point, not just in breast, but in other cancers as well. Uh, so I should say that I was, uh, as an outsider, which started, you know, my second career, um, I was really grateful for all the support that I got from Coke. And, uh, you know, uh, for many, it looked like, you know, the crazy person who tries to break into the, uh, you know, into the clinical care. But people at Coke actually did see it and supported me as much as they could in all different uh, ways, and I'm really grateful that this environment exists and everything that we can do to keep this environment going and uh, supporting all types of different research and not the same, all the same, but really different approaches, people coming together and making the change. And then there is something that I want to ask you as patients, because all of us at some point are going to be patients. Uh, the question is when <laughs> and how, but we're going to be patients. I am thinking about this woman, Nancy, who changed the laws. And uh, she took her own sorrow and used it as a, you know, as a specific case to change the law. And I think there will be a lot of exciting things going in AI, in breast cancer, in all different diseases. And I think we, as patients, deserve to get the best technology. And it shouldn't take 16 years to translate scientific insight into clinical practice. So each one of you who is a patient or gonna be a patient, we all need to think very creatively, what is the pathways that we can take to bring the science into clinical care for all of us? That's great, wonderful, thank you. Thank you all, sorry. We were thank you.